I didn't want to go to war. You know, I had one of my best friends killed before I ever got over there. And I figured, well, that's what's going to happen to me, too. And uh, it's a sad deal. When, when you see your buddies laying there in pieces, that's not a pretty picture, and it, it, it don't ever go away. No matter what you try to do, that picture's burned into your memory, and it, it's there forever. One word to describe my grandpa is a badass. He is the toughest person I know, but the funniest person I know, and he truly cares about the people he loves. And you can see that as he describes his experience in Vietnam. I was scared to death. You know, like anybody at that age, you're thinking, oh, I'm gonna go to Vietnam, I'm gonna die. And uh, it was a scary time. They take your whole life. I mean, from shaving your head to uh, your underwear and everything else they give you, and it's it's a totally different game. The boot camp was, I think it was only eight weeks long, and everywhere you went, you ran. You never opened your mouth. If you sat down in the in the cafeteria to eat, and anybody in there would ask a question, you were done eating. You could you had no no right to talk. So as soon as somebody would say something, then the drill sergeant would hear it your food went in the garbage and you were out the door. Every morning you had barrack inspection and we could never, we could never win. So our drill sergeant would call us a bunch of pigs. So in the morning we'd have to get up, low crawl underneath the barracks with your face down in the dirt and wear it all day. They said, if you're gonna live like a pig, you're gonna look like a pig. Strong, very strong, confident, funny, so that's more than one, but there's three. I was sent to Vietnam on December 21st, 1970. I landed in uh, Saigon, and that's just about like being in downtown Chicago. It was very clean. Uh, we had swimming pools. I mean, it, it, it would, you're thinking, oh, this is not bad at all. This is gonna be great. But the next day you're on a helicopter and you're, you're dropped off out in the jungle and then you're like, what did I get myself into? It was pretty scary. And was placed in the 59th Land Clearing Company and I was there in the rear for like one day and then I was shipped to, out to the jungle. And the way I went out there was on a, on a low boy with a D7 dozer on the back of it. And the guy driving said, when I slow down, you turn that machine sideways and drive it off of here and go. So I'm thinking, okay, I'm scared to death. I'm like, holy cow, what am I gonna do here? So all of a sudden he starts downshifting and slowing down. So I get the dozer off and I'm looking around. I see two dozers coming down the side of the mountain. I'm thinking, oh, this, this is good. The two guys that come and got me have mohawk haircuts. And I'm looking like, you know, I got the GI haircut, brand new clothes, dress greens. I, I'm like, what the hell? And I look at these guys and they're got cut off shorts, no shirts, mohawk haircuts. And I thought, what the hell did I just get into? And it was the best bunch of guys I've ever known in my life. I never had run heavy equipment or anything. I, I put it down, you know, they ask you 10,000 questions what you want to do in the Army, and you, you think, well, you're only going to do one thing. You're going to shoot a rifle, and, and that's it. And I put down heavy equipment operator, and I actually got sent to Fort Leonard Wood and, and uh, got training on the dozer, and I thought, man, this is great. You know, one of the few guys that actually did get what I wanted to do. I ran a D7 Caterpillar dozer knocking down the jungle. There was, uh, we had 30 D7 cats and 60 guys in the bush, and that's where we lived. We, you didn't go back to the rear, you didn't have 
We didn't have security. We did our own. We would dig in what we called our compound at night. We would take our dozers and push up a berm seven, eight foot tall and seal it completely off on the inside. And then we'd live in our tents and that's where we stayed. And we would stay in probably one spot for maybe maybe a month. And once we got where we were too far out, take us too long to get to where we were knocking down the jungle, then we'd have to move closer. And the areas we went to were called hot spots. And that's where the Vietnamese, the Viet Cong were, were dug in. And that, that's the reason we went in was to clear it. And I mean, we would, there'd be nothing left and we were done. The villages, we knocked down everything. There was nothing left. And there were booby traps. I think out of the 60 guys, I, I don't know of anybody that didn't either get hit at one time or another, but a, a lot of guys would hit booby traps. I actually pushed around 13 500 pound bombs that we dropped that didn't go off. And that's pretty scary when you're shoving a bomb that big around and your buddy tells you to get off and look in front of your dozer and you get out and holy shit. But it just got to be an everyday thing. I mean, there comes a point when you're over there, you lose your fear of dying. And once you, once you lose that, you're not, you're not afraid of anything, nothing. So nothing really bothered us. I mean, they'd tell us to go do this and we just do it. Oh. <laughs> that makes me laugh, um, crazy. One time they, uh, they brought steak and eggs out to us, which was, <laughs> nobody, I mean, that just didn't happen. And of course we're drinking and everybody likes hard boiled eggs. So we took a 50 gallon drum, filled it up with water and we took all the eggs and we boiled them. Nobody was gonna get eggs for breakfast. The steaks they had locked up, we couldn't get to them. But we boiled eggs <laughs> and we were eating eggs. Everybody was coming over there eating eggs and you know, you're cracking them. The whole inside of our tent, the floor was nothing but eggshells. It was just white. And when our sergeant come in in the morning to tell everybody that we were gonna have breakfast, he looked down and he said, holy shit. And he just turned around and walked right back out. Sometimes you would get two, three letters a week. And then like I said, when the monsoons would come in, you might not have contact with the rear for three weeks. So you'd go three, four weeks without a letter. And I'd, you'd get a little frustrated, but the letters from home were always uplifting. Everybody read their letters out loud. So kind of knew what everybody was doing. I actually did get a, a box of Twinkies from my mom and I ended up selling them for like 200 bucks. The guys wanted them and so they just started bidding on them and I said the highest bidder gets them and I got 200 bucks for them. And that was, a, you know, that was another thing, they paid us in cash. Now you're out in the bush, there's no stores and you got, every month you get paid, you got a handful of money. Money didn't mean anything. So the guys would play poker and you'd throw your wad in and then high card took it all. And sometimes there'd be five, six thousand dollars in the kitty. But that was one of the games we used to used to play. Also, Larry one time, Larry and, and, and Moonshine were really close. That's the two guys that had the Mohawk haircuts. They were tight. And uh, Larry got a Dear John letter from home. His wife run off with another guy and he's all depressed and he's sitting there and he's got his gun to his head like this and he's telling us, I'm just gonna kill it myself. And uh, <laughs> Bobby Fields always says, well, I always try to help when I can. He said, let me see that gun. Well, Bobby took the gun and he locked and loaded it. Well, Larry, he's sitting there and he says, you guys don't think I'll do it, do you? And he goes, go ahead. If that's what you wanna do, pull the trigger. Well, Larry goes like this, what the hell? He said, you actually loaded the damn thing? 
And he got court-martialed and had to pay for the holes in the tent, so he wasn't too happy. <laughs> but, yeah, it would, that's some of the good times. Well, the government just turned their head. I mean, the abuse of alcohol and drugs was rampant. You could get anything you want and do anything you want with it. And they didn't care. I think at, you know, at the time I was there, the war was kind of winding down and we were getting ready to get out. And from what I seen of it, the heroin addicts and the cocaine, and, and I'm sure the alcohol was just as bad, but not as many guys OD'd on the booze as, as the drugs. And you could see it all the time. We had a, we we're on the cut one day, we had a new medic come in. And when we came in, he was laying down with a heroin needle in his arm and he was passed out. And one of the guys in our outfit took his arm and broke it in about three places. And he never even woke up. And when he did, he's looking at his hands turned the other way. And of course, we had to medevac him out of there. But that's, I mean, our guys were, they could get mean. And like they said, he's not gonna, he wasn't gonna take care of anybody, so we shipped him out. And I would just wanna say that I love him and I'm so proud of him and I'm happy that he's my dad. When my daughter was born, I got a a pink pen that said it's a girl. And I wore it on my hat the whole time the whole time I was in Vietnam. And even when I came home I wore that hat for years. Probably ten years. And I was proud of the fact that, you know, I had I I was a dad. And I came home I wanna say in July or August and uh, just to see my daughter. And that was probably one of the greatest things I ever did in my life. Even though she was scared to death of me, but she didn't know who I was, but it, it just, the joy that I felt, you know, I did this and I was very happy to have your mother. And that was one of the first times that you could actually come back to the States because what they were afraid of was guys coming home and then going AWOL and not going back. But like I say, the group of guys I was with, I couldn't hardly wait to get back to make sure they were all right. Those guys, they would, they would die for you. They would do anything. Anything you wanted, they would do. I mean, we were, we were a close-knit machine, and that's, it was good. I think it was Dewey Canyon, too, was the last big push trying to get the communists out of the country. And we went into the canyon, and, uh, that was a big mistake. We had uh, five guys killed, seven wounded, and it was a it was a bad bad time. My take of it was, you know, we went up there with five dozers, and I think we had 10 operators, so you, you had to switch off. There's two guys on each dozer. And it was a big push. I mean, there were thousands and thousands of troops coming in behind us, and uh, tanks, and airstrikes, and 
I, it was a, a move to push communist troops out of uh, South Vietnam. But, you know, it's real easy to shoot downhill, but to shoot, them tanks only go so high. But when you're down in the bottom and they're up on the top, you're going to lose. And the Vietnamese, the North Vietnamese, the Dewey Canyon deal, that's why they call it, we were down in the canyon. They're up in the mountains and they're just picking us off like flies. I was scared to death. I hadn't got over the fear of dying yet, so I was, I was scared. And Tiny and Larry and them guys were like, let's go. I mean, when we first started going up there, we had, I think it was the Marine Corps was in front of us with mine sweep. They got a headset on it. We're doing about two miles an hour. We're thinking, we're gonna get killed right here. So Tiny says, get the hell out of the way. He drops his blade and Larry drops his and they're side by side. And now we're moving. We're, we're doing 15 miles an hour and we're going down the road and the tanks are trying to keep up. And the troops are trying to keep up. And, you know, we think we're on a highway. They call it QL1 to North Vietnam. And that's the road we were on. It was all overgrown and uh, bomb craters in it, and you know, and bridges blown out. And we we just have to make a road beside the bridges and hope you can make it to the river. And, and uh, yeah, it was. I was scared. Them guys, they didn't. They they, they acted like it was just an everyday job. Let's go. Take a couple more shots of whiskey and get down the road. And I know when it was over, I was one of the highest ranking guys left in the cup in, in our platoon that was up there. And I had to go to the graveyard and identify the bodies. And, you know, I'm thinking just our guys. And when you walk in there and there's hundreds of bodies and body bags, and they're looking through the numbers to try to figure out who your guys are so you can actually identify them. And they're just parts. They're not, I mean, we took a direct hit and there's just, there's some with heads, some without heads, some with their legs are gone. And they've got body parts laying all over and you, you're trying to identify each guy so that he can go home to his family. It's, it's tough. Even when we got back to our own outfit, guys were afraid to ask us about it because they were afraid the guys had snapped and maybe kill one of them. So, you, I mean, you could feel the guys that were up there and went through it. Uh, like I say, we were as tight as tight could be. And the other guys were, they knew we weren't the same anymore. I mean, it, something changed. It was after that that I figured when it was my time, it was my time and I had, I had no fear. I swung out of line and I went over and I got about 20 feet from the tree and the whole tree exploded. They had it booby trapped. So then I was medevac that day. I got hit four places in the in the legs. Three three in the right leg and one in the left leg. We got up in the air and the guy that took my spot in the front. He hit a booby trap, so we come right back down, picked him up, and they were taking us both to the hospital. We get to the hospital, and they just keep shooting you up with morphine. I mean, you can't, you can't feel your body at all. And uh, that day was was a rough day. They, we had combat all over, and there was guys coming in with their legs blowed off, arms blowed off. I'm sitting there, I'm bleeding, but I don't feel anything, and I'm like. Now, this can't be that bad. 
And then when I wake up in Japan, I'm like, what the hell happened here? I actually thought, I always tell the story, I said, uh, I thought I died and went to heaven. And uh, the reason for that, I was laying in the bed and I hear this, Mr. Morgan, Mr. Morgan. I open my eyes and there's a real good looking gal there and I'm thinking, holy shit, I made it. And then the gal shook me and I'm like, where in the hell am I at? Well, you're in the hospital in Japan. I'm like, ah, oh, it's almost heaven. And I think I told, at that time I was married to your grandma, and I think I called home and I said, bring me a pair of blue jeans and a t-shirt. They're like, what are you gonna do? I said, just bring blue jeans and a t-shirt. And when she showed up, I cut my hospital bands off and we left. And uh, I think I was home for like two weeks and my dad's going, you better get back, you're AWOL. I'm like, what are they gonna do, send me to Vietnam? I said, I, I don't care. So I finally did end up going back to the hospital and then they, they released me. I never had anybody ever spit at me or anything, but it wouldn't have been good if they did. But I know one of them told me as he's walking out of the airport and a guy spit on him and called him a baby killer. You know, he said at the time he, he was a young man too and he's like, what did I do wrong? I went over and I fought a war and I come home and now I'm the, the bad guy. And you know, he always felt it was wrong and I always thought it was wrong, you know, for anybody to treat somebody like that when they've been to war, it's not good. People are actually afraid of you when you get first get back because they don't know how you're gonna act. And they're so afraid you're gonna have a flashback and start chopping off heads and shooting people. It's, you know, it makes you feel like you're alone. But I think it made me a, a better person. I'm. I'm proud of what I did. We are so proud of you, Papa. We are so proud of you. We are so proud of you. We are so proud of you, Papa. We are so proud of you. We are so proud of you and we love you. We are so proud of you and we love you, Papa Tom. We are so proud of you and we love you, Papa Tom. We love, love you, Dad. Dad. Awesome. <laughs> This is my second year in the class, and last year I did a documentary on Mick Fru, a Vietnam veteran, and it was the most rewarding experience of my life, and I am truly thankful to know his story. This year I decided to do my grandpa, and he was a little apprehensive at first to get an interview done because he was nervous about the emotions that it would bring up and how it would make him feel, but I really encouraged him that it was a very rewarding experience and it would help him heal from the war. Me and my grandpa have never been very close and that is one of the reasons why I wanted him to come in and get an interview done because I wanted to understand what he truly went through when he was my age in Vietnam and I am so thankful that he decided to be a part of this experience with me. I am truly thankful to the Harlem Veteran Project for affording me so many opportunities and allowing me to understand what our veterans have truly went through. I just want to say thank you, Papa Tom, for being a part of this experience. I love you. There's no such thing as Seems like we brought a dog. <laughs> Hide right in the back, all the way down. Uh, oh, you and we all... mom did. And everybody else Oh, wait, you're saying in... back seat? Like yeah. back, back, like oh. next to the window, I think. Because like, I remember <laughs> sitting on the floorboard no in the back. There were... I think my parents went across the street to Kentucky Fried Chicken. <laughs> and they weren't gone probably five minutes. And then she ended up pregnant. My mom goes, I didn't leave them alone. I always told my mom, it didn't take five minutes. <laughs> and mom and Casey back there. <laughs> 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 How much longer? 19 it hours. Jimmy. It was oh, a red and white Jimmy. Yeah. Yeah. I always tell the kids, I said, you know, None of you were planned, you were all a mistake. I said, we didn't, we didn't do the Planned Parenthood. 
I said Casey was the only one that we planned and he ended up being a, a boy instead of a girl, so. Yeah, like, act like you love each other. Hmm. No, don't <laughs> do that. That's weird. That is weird. <laughs> That's not my arm. Is this like Frank? <laughs> <laughs> stuck, stuck in the humper. <laughs> Hump mode. <laughs> Crazy. I said you got lights like this. That's what you were doing. <laughs> lights like this? Yeah. I was at the police station. <laughs> no. Chicken's been good. <laughs> He's kicked a hole in the garage. Oh, 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 you did that cowboy You did that cowboy There's only three could kick a hole in the garage door. Cowboy Casey kicked a hole in the garage door. Thank you. Yes, thank you so much. You're welcome, baby. I love you. I love you.